Um, I, I would really like to thank the organizers uh, for having invited me to speak at this conference. Um, I've been affiliated with Israel on and off ever since Rafi Levine had me as a postdoc many years ago. Um, we won't say how many years ago, Rafi, but since then, the Weizmann and Israel has been very, very kind to me, and I'm very grateful for having these interactions. I want to tell you today about a different direction uh, than ones we've done in the past, but related to coherences and decoherence and so on. Um, and that is that there is this great enthusiasm for looking for quantum effects in biology. Uh, I got involved in it because of these photosynthetic light harvesting experiments that I will describe briefly and that Shaw will describe briefly and that Greg Engel was heavily responsible for. So uh, let me follow the organizing committee suggestions, uh, say something about the field in general, say what we've done to address some of the issues and where should we be going and how do we get there, and I will attempt to do so regel achat, which means on one leg, since time is very short. Um, so the field it rates, it really goes back as, as far as uh, Schrodinger in 1944. Schrodinger said that molecular behavior underlies biological function. Quantum mechanics, of course, are the rules of molecular behavior. And so interest is in not simply things like level spacings and so on, which are common quantum effects, but rather non-trivial quantum effects, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, the key question is, are such features manifest in nature? Um, now, there's a very interesting debate. If you want to see this, uh, in 2008, there was a conference, Quantum Aspects of Life, and uh, the organizing committee asked the people who believed in quantum effects to argue against quantum effects in nature, and the people who did not believe in quantum effects to argue for it. So, and that's a published uh, a part of this uh, book. It's really quite interesting. But in any case, why would not? Why would we affect? Why would we expect? quantum effects to disappear because of interactions with the environment. This is so-called decoherence. Decoherence of a system is generally responsible for the loss of quantum mechanical effects. And this is what modern quantum biology, quantum biology materializes every 40 or 50 years. If you look in the literature, they say, hey, things are, this is an interesting topic and so on. But nowadays, light-induced processes, this is what I will talk about, olfaction, that is the me me mechanism of smell, bird migrations, how do birds manage to make it from one part of the earth to another, and each one of these requires a detailed individual analysis. I'm going to look at the case of light-induced processes, vision and photosynthesis. Actually, I'll primarily focus on vision, but the results I'll show are applicable to the photosynthetic business. And all of this is motivated by these modern laser experiments that Shaul alluded to, um, where one looks at pulsing the system, pulsing the system again, pulsing it again and looking at the output signal, things that Graham Fleming started, Greg Engel here, Greg Scholes, Dwayne Miller, Jennifer Ogilvy. These are just sample people who are intimately involved in these kind of experiments. And they applied it first to a little tiny piece of the photosynthetic light harvesting apparatus. So this is a big chunk of stuff that absorbs light Energy is transferred down through a wire called FMO, and it goes to this reaction center where there is some kind of chemical reaction. And the anticipation was hopping of energy through the through this FMO, which is comprised of eight uh, chromophores. Um, and uh, in fact, what was observed, you'll excuse the fact that we're using the seven mode model here, and this was a calculation what was observed is that the energy transferred down to the reaction center through pathways that showed oscillatory behavior. So the energy was seen to show this kind of oscillatory wave-like character, and the interpretation at that time was that they were seeing a quantum mechanical effect. The same thing uh, in this uh, currently wired light harvesting system, a marine algae system, which is really does absorb light, it's buried in here, the DBV dimer, which absorbs light, transfers it to these MBV dimers, and the net result is, when you do the experiment, oscillations in these maps that Shaul referred to, which were alluded, which were attributed to quantum coherence effects. And so um, the question was, are we actually seeing 
there are two different questions. One Shal alluded to, which is, is this electronic or vibrational? I'm not going to get involved in that. But um, the idea is that these coherences are somehow how a manifestation of the way nature uses quantum effects. OK, so there it is, observations in FMO, PC645. It was a very long coherence, it's much longer than expected. And the same time in the visual process, we've heard two lectures already about the molecule retinal. The molecule retinal is embedded in a very complex environment and undergoes cis-trans isomerization, a motion like this, when a, a, a light is absorbed. And this is why you see me. You see me solely because light enters your eye, retinal undergoes cis-trans isomerization. This sends a signal to your brain, aha, Brummer is moving his arm, or something like that. Okay. Now, the reason why one would be very loath to believe that there are quantum effects involved in this process, this rotational isomerization, is because it's buried in this huge protein matrix. And that protein matrix would destroy uh, quantum mechanical effects. But look at this. Look at the enthusiasm. I love this list. This is the over-enthusiasm for light harvesting quantum effects. So from somebody at MIT, having learned that photosynthesis does this, it turns out that bacteria have been up to quantum computation for hundreds of millions of years. That's a true quote. When I told the guy, if I woke up in the morning and I'd ever say that, I would shoot myself, he said, well, it was a kind of a public thing. Uh, then DARPA called for proposals. Now that non-linear, non-trivial quantum effects have been on a big observed in biology, let's make a sensor. Other people were writing in Nature that they're watching plants do quantum mechanics, and Nature, again, had the dawn of quantum biology. And all of this, as I said, was due to the fact that one was in an environment that should have destroyed um, quantum effects. So the question really is, are these observations of these very long time scales, these long-lived coherent dynamics in vision and, um, and in uh, these uh, photosynthetic pieces significant biologically? And again, I say one would not have expected this simply because of this external decoherence. So we began to look at this. We began to examine this question. And um, uh, I would like to report on this, and I'll tell you what my summary is. First, experimental, the light-induced coherences that are observed experimentally are not observed in nature. Um, Ultra-fast rates that are often stated for some of these processes, like the visionary process, are not the rates in nature. But there may be significant other kinds of quantum mechanics, quantum uh, coherences, sorry, which are due to the system in interacting with the environment. So let's just define what we're looking for. Non-trivial means effects like interference, entanglement, non-locality. These are uh, ideas which are, are at the heart of modern quantum mechanics, tested by things like Bell inequalities, legged guard measurements, all these words. And if you want to see a review, we just wrote it, uh, appeared last year in Advancing Chemical Physics to try and introduce some of these ideas. Have anybody ever observed this in nature? No. None of these have ever been observed except this interference, and these interferences have been attributed to coherences. Coherences being coupling between the electronic eigenstates of the molecule. All right, here's the case I want to look at. I want to look at the vision case, and you've seen a few of these uh, pictures before, but this molecule, uh, cis retinal is embedded in a membrane. Uh, here is a kind of a schematic of this thing. And when it uh, absorbs light, there's a cis to all trans photoisomerization that looks like this. Examined in a pump probe experiment, you pump, the system travels down the upper electronic curve, crosses over to the ground state, where this is the trans product. And that corresponds to going from this configuration to this configuration. And this is a widely studied process. Here's a picture of just a few of the studies that have come out in the last few years. People studying fixed number of photons with rod cells, uh, the human eye uh, revealed by electrical neuroimaging. Is the human visual system a double slit photon interference detector? Um, Dwayne Miller's experiment on local vibrational coherences drive the primary photon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, there's a whole book that just came out 
uh, on this topic recently. And this is the picture. You see, this comes from a medical journal where the cis-trans isomerization step is here, and it re essentially goes through a series of processes until this is regenerated in your eye. If it's not regenerated, you wouldn't be able to see uh, after you've seen. But these, exp in, the, in the case of vision, these coherences haven't observed for years. Uh, 1994, uh, in these famous experiments where one pumped the system and observed these kind of coherences. Here is the latest experiment by Dwayne Miller where he claimed local vibrational coherences are the primary driving force for, for chemistry of vision. In my view, this is just not correct. And the reason for it is very, very simple. These processes are induced by incoherent solar or lunar light or natural light, but laser experiments use fast coherent pulses. These are totally different perturbations to the molecule and give totally different results. The pulse case induces coherences, time evolution, whereas incoherent light just gives stationary processes. There's no time evolution. And there's no discussion about this. This is well known in the literature. We wrote a paper back in 1991 about this topic. Yoshua Yortner wrote numerous papers before about the differences in response of molecules to different kinds of light. It turns out, however, that incoherent radiation is kind of interesting. And we've been studying it uh, on and off for a number of years. So when you do an experiment in the laboratory and you use a laser pulse, you're creating a, a superposition of states which evolves in time which is totally different than what nature does. Where does this fit together experiment, uh, 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 conceptually? Well, pulsed laser experiments provide information on the system and the interaction of the system with the environment. And that kind of information is crucial if you then want to model the experiment in the steady state, model the process in the steady state corresponding to nature. We need that information. And incoherent experiments are very hard to do. So pulse lasers give us information, but they are misinterpreted as being relevant to nature. So that was the question we asked. Are laboratory ex uh, uh, supposed to be coherences, uh, oh, sorry, laboratory observed light coherences relevant to nature? And the approach I took was minimal models. I want to design minimal models that contain all of the essential physics, do the computations for them, and see what we get. And that's what we did. We took here in photosynthesis, you might have a donor uh, transferring energy to the acceptor. And it turns out that the, the light is sufficiently weak that, in general, one ignores the possibility of what are called two exciton states. And if you do that, it turns out it's exactly the same as a three-level system like this. So we studied the three-level system, pumped by incoherent radiation uh, uh, with uh, Sorry, this is the radiative pump. This is the spacing between them with uh, spontaneous emission from both states or alternatively coupling to baths. And we asked what happens. And we did it. Uh, we had to design new tools to do this. There's a PRL in which we discussed some of the tools for the master equations necessary. And we started by a sudden turn-on experiment that mimics the pulsed uh, experiment. It turns out if you do that, then you, you can see two different cases, a small molecule case and a big molecule. In the small molecule case, you see these oscillations, which are just like the oscillations seen in FMO and PC645. And the reason why they fall into a small molecule domain has to do with the, the, the energy spacing of levels uh, which absorbs this kind of light. I won't discuss that now. But I just want to kind of point out there's a very interesting effect in a different domain. These are the coherences here. Um, and it turns out that in this domain, even though fluorescence emission, for example, occurs on a scale of 10 to the minus 9, these coherent 10 minus 9 seconds, these coherences will survive for a 1,000 times longer. So it's just an interesting thing. It's never been observed experimentally. I'd like to motivate that experiment sometime. OK, so we know that these sudden pulses will produce these kind of coherences. And actually, there are two such kinds of coherences. OK. Um, but natural turn on of light is very slow. If you're looking at me and you blink, that's the turn on time for the light in your eye. 
That blinking time is a, a millisecond, which from the point of view of a molecule is infinity. Molecular time scales are 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. From the point of view of this molecule, you blink an infinite amount of time has occurred during the time of the turn on. OK, so we have to examine the case of the turn on of incoherent light. And it turns out you have to design a whole new theory for that as well, because incoherent radiation is normally treated as a, uh, a statistical treatment. And the statistical treatments always assume the light is on all the time. If you want to have a slow turn on or any turn on of this environmental radiative bath, you have to build a new theory. And the way to do that is really very, very simple. You find yourself an outstanding graduate student who knows how to do it, and he does it, right? Amr Dodan was fantastic, uh, and he really did a wonderful job. But look at the results. This is what happens if the turn-on time becomes longer. Remember, in the domain of small molecules, we saw these coherent oscillations. That's this first picture. Now the turn on of that light slows down and slows down more. And even though the coherences are still there, you have to look at the scale. The scale here is 10 to the minus 3. The scale here is 10 to the minus 6, which means that by slowing down the light, the coherence has gone down by a factor of 1,000. But even in this scale, the turn on time is enormously fast compared to the blink of your eye. If or, or any other in photosynthetic light harvesting, the turn on of the sun. Um, if you wanted to actually extrapolate this plot out to the turn on times you would have in normal light, you'd have to take this out somewhere to uh, a lot, probably not even, you wouldn't get there with a lot. You'd have to go to England or France or someplace like that. And then you would discover that this just completely goes away. As the turn on time slows down, the coherences disappear. Um, one can also do it in this other domain of these other coherences that I mentioned to you. And again, these are the coherences as one slows down the turn-on time, up on the top of the populations, which are not the focus at the moment of this discussion. But again, here you get 0.03. Here, this is already down to uh, uh, 100 times slower than that smaller than that, and if you keep going, it will just disappear. So there, uh, and you can do an analysis, an analytic analysis, of how turn-on times link to the time to turn on the radiation, and so on. And the net result is you end up with expressions that say that the turn-on time has to be fast. Here is the turn-on time of the light. Here is a typical period of the dynamics. If you want to get these kind of oscillatory coherences, you have to do so in a turn-on time of the radiation that is less than the typical turn-on, the typical time of the molecule. So in other words, if the electronic levels are spaced by, I don't know, let's give it a big number, 10 to the minus 12 seconds, you have to turn on your light faster than 10 to the minus 12 seconds to see these kind of coherences. Simply not biologically relevant. Okay. Um, but, you know, so what is it then? In nature, you have to treat the light as being an incoherent radiation, stationary, on for a long time, which means that you have to treat the thing in the steady state, not with these pulses, which are very important to study laboratory pulse experiments, but you must do steady state. So uh, in this retinal isomerization, a fantastic case. It's not just in vision. It, it occurs all over the place. It occurs in bacteria for bacterial rhodopsin. It occurs in uh, channel rhodopsin in your brain uh, to open and close ion channels and so on. And there are, if you want to see some beautiful, well, if you want to see a beautiful book on the subject, you should look at Bialik's book on biophysics um, and a recent book by Nelson called From Photon to Neuron, talking about uh, vision. OK, so again, the question. Uh, are these coherences a natural retinal isomerization? Because now I want to do the steady state. Uh, with natural incoherent light and slow turn on, do they occur? If they are occurring, do they bother, uh, do they matter to the bioprocess? What's the role of the environment, uh, if there's a role? And then there is this literature that says the rates of retinal isomerization is, and that's a quote from the literature, as fast as nature can allow. 
Okay, that, that's a direct cause. Now, it turns out this is an interesting issue because there's something called the quantum speed limit um, and, and, a cla and so on and so on. So I wanted to relate, at least look at these rates and see what it means and whether it occurs in nature as fast as nature will allow. So we did a study, we built a model, um, and, and uh, the model is, you know, simple. It's based upon uh, a, a very, uh, or, or a common used model of Stuck and Hahn, but we did it with incoherent radiation, excitation, emission, and a whole bunch of stuff that gives us a set of equations that we can actually solve to address the question of the role of the coherences and the uh, significance of uh, the rates and so on. So again, we started out with this model. We did sudden turn on of this model. And we looked at the production of the product, the depletion of the reactants as a function of time. And it turns out, because we're looking at it in this nice picture, we can actually look at the relaxation as it occurs and the system drops down from higher energy levels down to lower energy levels down to lower energy levels till it reaches this case where it sort of stabilizes. And one can calculate from this the quantum yield of the process. That is to say, um, how much product do you make for each incident photon of light? And if you do that, well, first let me tell you, are there coherences here? So if the turn on is sudden, just focus on the red line, then it turns out that the coherences are there, as you can see them. Here they are. This is a typical off-diagonal element of the density matrix that gives you the coherences. As you turn on the light slower and slower, these oscillatory coherences go away, just as I promised you. But I want you to notice something. I know he's going to tell me to run back to the microphone. But I want you to notice something over here. These coherences actually persist, and I'll come back to them shortly. They're not the light-induced coherences that everybody's excited about. So the question, do the light-induced coherences matter to the quantum yield of the retinal process? Well, here's the calculation. Now, you may think that this is a picture of dots of data connected by lines, which is what you would normally expect. It's not. The dots are the case without the coherence, light-induced coherences included, and the line is when the coherences are included. So it's crystal clear from this kind of calculation that the light-induced coherences play zero role, well, tiny, tiny role, in the uh, 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 quantum yield produced in retinal isomerization. Now, it, 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 the key question is twofold. First of all, two questions. What the heck is this? These are coherences that seem to survive, and they do so even after the light is turned on very slowly. And, uh, um, and the second question is, why is the quantum yield so uh, uh, insensitive to the presence of, of the light-induced coherences? So we did a study, and we repeated these calculations. And I just note that this, this stuff survives even in the law, when the turn-on is slow. What we did was we varied the system bath coupling, bath being the external environment. So here was the case before. There, there is the case before this one here. Where there's just a tiny difference when the system uh, environment interaction is the normal interaction. But if we weakened it, then we compare this curve to this one, and we managed to see that there is an effect. Uh, due to the light-induced coherences, when one has a weakened interaction between the system and the bath. So the question now becomes, what is the role, and this is something we're examining, of these uh, uh, bath-induced coherences? They're induced by the environment uh, in the system, and they are relevant to the uh, coherence uh, contribution to the quantum yield. One of the really interesting questions I'll come to, uh, to mention later as a grand challenge is nature has all of these different retinals, and they all are in different environments. And maybe nature has optimized these system bath couplings in order to improve the sensitivity uh, of qu to quantum coherences. Um, we examine these bath coherences, and, and we have uh, 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 calculations for it and we have a model for it, but I won't describe it now. 
because I want to turn the next uh, five minutes and 42 seconds to the issue of rates. Rates as fast as nature will allow, right? And, and maybe there's a quantum effect there. So let me go and look at this. Now, most people don't realize that rates are a function of the setup that you use. And if you, I mean, Shapiro and I discussed this in this book of ours, Quantum Control and Molecular Processes, but the rates that people are getting, 100 femtoseconds or less, are rates that they see under the transient pulsed excitation experiment. And that's a rate that may uh, be relevant in that experiment, but has, I claim, uh, let's see if it has anything to do with nature. Now, what you have to do is a, it's a long-term process, long-time process. You, you have to calculate the steady state rate. You have to look for the possibility of quantum mechanics. mechanics. If you set up the normal formalism, you're doing time-dependent master equations over a long time for dynamics, which is very fast. And that turns out to be extraordinarily difficult. So again, you look around, find a good graduate student, right? That's very important, that part. You get a good graduate student, this time Simon Axelrod, and together we built an entirely new approach to solving this problem without doing the time dependence. And I, I really don't have time to describe it other than to say that what one does is to use the uh, basically, it's a Fourier transform picture, not exactly. One defines a uh, progress variable for the observable you're looking at, and one calculates moments of these observables, and then ultimately rebuilds the dynamics um, and the rates. And the method is very, very fast. Instead of taking hours of calculation time, it just uh, days of calculation time, it is reduced on a laptop to an hour or so, um, and it's very, very effective. We just sent in a paper on this, which is under consideration. And uh, here are examples of reconstructed dynamics of uh, retinal isomerization, uh, looking at the depletion of the initial state. And these are uh, sample pictures. I won't give you a description of the various uh, possibilities, various uh, content here, other than to say the following. These are what we get for the rates. When this calculated quantity stabilizes, this gives you the rate of the process. Now take a look at the time scales. Remember, the literature is full of statements that says retinal isomerization occurs on 200 femtoseconds, 100 femtoseconds, 50 femtoseconds. Now they're down to 30 femtoseconds uh, as the lasers become, uh, experiments become more and more um, complex, I would say. But look at this. I'm claiming time scales of 75 picoseconds. That's a 1,000 times longer. And in your eye, when the eye filters the light, it turns out that one is talking about, these are microseconds, sorry. This is the calculation, I apologize. This, the observed value is up here. It's microseconds, not picoseconds. The rates we're observing are microseconds. And in your eye, the rates we're observing are milliseconds. Totally different than what is predicted in a pulsed experiment. Um, OK, so what's happening here is simple. The natural rates of these processes are far, far, far. I didn't have enough far, fars in there. Far, far, far longer than the transient 100 femtosecond pulse laser results. Um, they're not excitingly quantum. They're just the rate at which the light is absorbed. And the light, which is the rate of absorption, is the rate determining step. And it's just very slow because sunlight is incredibly weak. So that's the uh, 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 process, uh, uh, con uh, the rate determining step. It actually motivates a lot of interesting and relevant studies, but not for this discussion. OK, so the summary thus far on light-induced processes, the observed time-dependent coherences of photosynthesis and visual systems are not relevant to natural biological cases, um, hence uh, the biology, these are not the quantum biology effects that are being looked for. Um, in such processes, there is a strong system environment interaction that is relevant. We are examining whether that is relevant as entangled quantum or it's just classical and so on. And the, one of the important points to make is that any of these studies you do for natural processes have to be done in the steady state. Okay. And in fact, what needs to be on in the long term, I'll give you some detailed statement in a minute, 
But one of the things is people have to recalibrate their intuition. Um, generations of light-induced process in molecules have been understood via transient pulse laser approaches. And these approaches are not applicable to the steady state. And, and the, the, this is, I, wanna, I mean, I had a three hour conversation with somebody in Hawaii who's been doing these experiments for 40 years until he finally said, you're right. We just think wrongly. Anyway, I summarized these ideas in a very recent uh, uh, perspective in Jay Fiskem letters. Okay, so where should we be going and how do we get there? So we're doing some of these things and, and I think there's lots more to be done. Their experiments have to use incoherent excitation or at least use pulses in accordance with some scheme that, for example, we proposed. You could take pulses and randomly put them together and end up with uh, the, the incoherent result. Theory, really have to understand classical versus quantum aspects of all of these stuff, of the observables, of the stationary coherences. You have to understand what is an experimental signal of quantum versus classical. That's very, very hard. Here you get a time-dependent signal. You have no idea whether it's quantum or classical coherence. You can try these legged guard tests and so on. Very hard to apply. So this is a very difficult question. Computational has to be done with uh, much more realistic systems. I say I will be willing to do it within reason, uh, but I think people should really get down to the difficult problem of doing it. And then there's the question of generalizing to other light-induced bioprocesses, channel redoption in the brain, and all things like that, and, and integrating lots of these new experiments. Uh, these are the new experiments, for example, in the vision case. And I just mentioned this again to bring down the idea that even if you want to do these large-scale computational studies, despite the argument by a lot of people that excited state potential surfaces are available and readily used, usable, which I fell into that trap. There are lots of challenges in excited state potential surfaces. We need them if you want to do, so as I said before, analysis of pulsed laser studies to extract um, uh, information. And finally, let's not forget that the, there are quantum issues in olfactory, bird navigation, brain dynamics, and so on, which require completely different studies. And I thank these three people. Amr Dodani was a graduate student of mine. Now he's a grad student at MIT. Simon Axelrod, who is an MSD student at University of Toronto, and Timur Cherbel, who is a research associate with me and is now at the University of Nevada. And I thank you for your attention. Yes, Albert. Can I make a, a couple of comments? One is that I'm, we're talking about one single photon processes in, in let's say, vision Absolutely. or photosynthesis, whatever you like. And so as, as I think most of us will agree that, that the pulse shape, in other words, the timing doesn't matter in a single photon process. So the, whether the pulse is, is short or not is really of no consequence. It's only the spectrum that counts. And since these are non-degenerate, the colors are not the same in that spectrum, therefore they're not interfering. So it seems to me that in a way, what you're saying is, well, the pulse shape doesn't matter, it's only the spectrum. So I'd like to make an analogy with a, a problem that is very well known. And I, I think that there's merits in thinking about the short pulse experiment and the eigenstate picture. And that is, uh, let's take uh, overtones uh, in the benzene molecule. So uh, it's known in spectroscopy that if you look at overtones in the benzene molecule, you can fit the overtone spectrum to something that looks kind of like a Morris oscillator. And what you see as, this was done in around 1980 or so. And uh, this was, see, it was seen that as you go up, the overtone line width in, increases and people said, ah, that's because when you pluck this H atom, if you pluck it harder and harder, you get increasing IVR. So I'd say there's two ways to look at this. One way is to say, ah, oh, well, I'm plucking this uh, CH stretch, 
and a tiny main picture, and then it rings for a while, but then it excites the ring modes, and then it loses energy. The other way is to say, well, okay, this is a highly vibrationally excited molecule. There are exact vibrational eigenstates. I may not know what they look like, but they, nature knows how to solve that Schrodinger equation. And so these are, uh, you know, they're not normal modes at all. And all I'm doing with the pulse experiment is I'm making a coherent superposition of all of those that for a short little while looks like a zero order state. So I'd say the merit of creating pulses and looking for oscillations or ring is simply to make a, a picture, a zeroth order picture of, of what you create and how it evolves with time. It's perfectly fine to say that, you know, if you're prepared with a uh, incoherent light that you prepare eigenstates, that's true, but we can't easily understand the full solution. So therefore, understanding is gained by creating superpositions and watching them evolve. And I don't really see the contradiction between those two pictures. There is no, absolutely no contradiction. The point though is that the question that I was addressing emanated from the literature on photosynthetic light harvesting enthusiasm for coherences in quantum biology. And therefore, my emphasis is on the need to do the stationary state, uh, steady, steady, steady state, and hence stationary picture in that case. Um, I, as I said, pulse laser experiments have a significant role in, in giving us information about the Hamiltonian and the system bath code. Uh, it's related to Elber's question. So suppose I only have one retinal molecule on the membrane. I'm just staring at that one. Now you have excitation by incoherent light. And there's a light level, let's say, uh, one million photon per second, incoherent, right? So if it's incoherent, the photons still arrive one at a time. Okay. The separation among, uh, between two adjacent photons is uh, one microsecond, right? But, but the moment the photon strikes that retinal molecule still has a time spread of uh, not too long, say, okay, uh, let, five minutes, let, right? Let, let me address this question in two steps. Uh, but I haven't finished. Let, but they, but let, I think you got my question. Yeah, uh, that's I, fine. I, yeah. I know your question. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm addressing the premise of your question. Mm. The picture you have in your mind is here is a molecule and here comes a photon and a little while later comes another photon, another photon. This picture is, is, is I won't, I, let me, I, I'm not saying it's incorrect, it's irrelevant. And the reason why it's irrelevant is because incoherent radiation is described solely by a statistical statistical properties. Now, as long as you have any source whatsoever that produces the same G1, the same for, for a G1 correlation function, that result will be exactly the same. For example, okay, I can take waves that are CW but jump at certain times, and another one that jumps at a different time, and another one that jumps and so on. Or I could take little packets little packet coming in, and then at some random time it comes in later and say, or I could take a photon. Every one of these is a completely satisfactory picture as long as it produces the same G1. Remember, these are linear spectroscopy experiments. So I don't believe in the idea that a photon is arriving at some arbitrary time because you're not doing an experiment that measures the photon arrival. If you do an experiment that measures the photon arrival, then you'll see the arrival of photons. If you don't do such an experiment, then you won't. Let me just make one further comment to this. If you look in this Nelson book, you'll see that he has pictures of photon arrivals, okay? And he says, you see, the light is made out of particles. Now go to um, any really serious quantum optics book and you'll see that when they talk about shot noise, which is what is a typical arrival time, there are two contributions. 
One contribution is from the particulate nature of the light. The second contribution is from the particulate nature of the material absorbing the light. The second one, the material, for example, in a piece of wire, the electrons, that dominates all the way down to very, 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 uh, um, quant and down all the way down to quantum light. So that picture of photon arrival, for example, is not even valid for shot noise. Only if you have a detector and an experiment set up exactly to measure photons can you talk about photons. Otherwise, you just have in this, you know, you have. I, I saw in this case the retinal is the detector. Oh. That is the material. Okay, right. so fine. Yeah. So now comes the question, and if you'll come back to me in nine months or so, we may have the birth of the proper theory. There, uh, to my knowledge, Nobody has really analyzed, we are doing the analysis now, as to these two contributions to the absorption of light by, of incoherent light by retina. Um, if you want my bet, I'm going to say that what you'll see is the particulate nature of the electrons in the retina, giving you that signal, and not anything to do with photon arrivals. That's my bet. If I analyze both terms, I think you'll see the second one. Yeah. Uh, 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 just really quick, I, I guess my, uh, the key issue, I mean, I, I'm not arguing with you, right, but my impression is once that detector of retinal molecule receives that photon, the physical the isomerization process is still fast. Otherwise, I cannot reconcile. Um, uh, let me just uh, make yeah. one other statement. Yeah. If you teach elementary quantum mechanics, mm -hmm and you do simple perturbation theory with even CW radiation, and you plot, say for retinal, the probability of exciting the excited state of retinal in this light, you will get a straight line, either depending if you do uh, uh, the, the amplitudes or the population, you will see with CW light, you'll see a straight line for absorption. I would like you to tell me where in that straight line are the photon absorption? Well, There's no it, jump. It, that has uncertainty, but the molecular no motion is fast. No uncertainty. No uh, uncertainty. Okay, we should discuss this. I'll be happy to talk to you about. Yeah, I think most of us have <laughs> activity in, from the back. Yes, I just back to the mystery. There's work going on both at the Technion and NYU on uh, retinal prosthesis using ultrasound excitation. It's nothing to do with photons. Interesting. Also, you have, you know, you have uh, um, noise-induced processes of retinal isomerization on the ground state. This is also a known uh, process. Is there any puzzle? Oh, yes, please turn here. Phenomenological comment. How you define vibrational states when you have non-adiabatic dynamics playing tricks when oh, so we calculate, I mean, we have a simple states. model, right? Uh, it's a, the standard uh, Stock-Hahn model, which is a two-mode model of retinal isomerization. And we solve for the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, uh, vibrational and electronic eigenstates in Hamiltonian. So you work with a diabetic picture? We're working with, the di in, in our case, we're working diabetic. You can do either one. As long as you do the problem completely, then you get the exact states. Microphone, yeah, come up here, Benny. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's the best I have, okay? So m my question is related to the title of your lecture and also the motivation. I got, uh, at some point, you listed the different quantum effects. And I must say, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I was left with the impression that you see two types of quantum effects, if not three. One which is very deep and very profound and has to do with things like Bell inequalities and coherences and several other modern developments. Very interesting, I have no doubt. But there are simply quantum effects and non-adiabatic transition 
is an example also yes. of a quantum effect. So, but you somehow... Maybe okay, you're, uh, I, I felt you're relegating it to something I, in field. I, I'm, I'm uh, um, quoting the way the field is looking for, quote, non-trivial quantum effects. This is not my definition. It's a definition of the field. We all agree that there are non-adiabatic transitions. We all agree there are conical intersections. We and all agree... And they're quantum mechanical. And we all believe that there are energy levels and so on. But the the revelation, if you wish, that there are possible effects like entanglement and non-locality and so on motivates a lot of this uh, direction. Okay. Right?